One cool thing about having this online is that I don't need a lot of microscopes for all of the students. And so I can actually show you how a research grade microscope works. So here's my nice research grade microscope here. Okay, you can see it has a camera attached to the top, which is attached to the computer. We're gonna zoom in here so that I can talk about various features of this guy. Now this scope has a lot of bells and whistles associated with a regular scope. So normally in the classroom, we're looking at straight bright field microscopy. Light starts in the substage, it goes upward, it goes through various features in the substage, one being the condenser, it's condensed, goes through that object, so we're looking at transmitted light. Transmitted light then goes through your objective. It's magnified again by your oculars, as we mentioned before. Now, the problem with transmitted light is that um, in order to see objects, the cells are really small, and most of the components of cells are totally see-through. And so the problem with transmitted light is that it takes a lot of light for resolution. That's why when we go up under oil immersion, we have to put a drop of oil on to increase the amount of light that gets into the objectives so that we can see small, teeny, tiny bacteria under oil immersion. The problem is when you increase that light, you wash out small transparent objects. And that's why when we look through a bright field microscope at a cell, we cannot see very much stuff in the cell um, through the microscope. Right? For example, when you looked at the cheek cells under a 40x objective and a 100x objective, we couldn't see much in there. All we could see was the cytoplasm. We could see the stained part being the nucleus being stained. We could see the stained um, bacteria, but that's all that we could see. Now, this scope has a lot of bells and whistles associated with getting around that factor. Under here, I have a substage. It has probably 10 different settings that I can spin around here. One of the settings on here is called phase contrast. Phase contrast, instead of using direct light going through, it has a stop. The light hits that stop, stops, and then it only uses indirect light. Okay, and then it has a couple other features of increasing wavelengths and decreasing wavelengths that make things either dark or, or light. Now, if I was going to use this scope to look at pond water organisms, and because this is an online lab, we can use this scope to look at pond water organisms, and we will in a minute. So what I would use is a something called DIC, or differential interference contrast. The way DIC works is that under here I have a setting. I turn it to that setting. This setting then has a prism where a light beam comes in through the bottom, hits that prism, and split into two parallel running beams. Those beams run through the object parallel, go up, and then I shoot in these two prisms. And when these two prisms go in, they bring the two beams of light back together, and so I see a three-dimensional image um, of that object. And I'm actually going to show you, show you that here. Okay, so now we're looking at DIC under the 20x objective, so 200x magnification. Here's a nice blepharisma. And so you can see all those internal organelles and everything in that blepharism under the DIC. You can really see the uh, cilia around the mouth region of that blepharism. Okay. And then if we go back out to bright field microscopy. This is what regular bright field microscopy looks like. This microscope has the capability of what's called fluorescence. Here's my power source for my fluorescence. This is my mercury vapor lamp for my fluorescence. This is a full spectrum, spectrum mercury vapor lamp. This then is delicate. So in order to operate this fluorescence, you have to have a log. You log in when you turn this on, you log in when you turn it off. It has to be on for 30 minutes or off for 30 minutes or else you can have problems with your mercury vapor lamp. Fluorescence is quite a bit different because fluorescence, it does not work on transmitted light. So what happens with fluorescence is that we have an object, we put a fluorescent dye on that object, okay? Um, when that dye gets stimulated by the right color of light, it comes in, it hits it, that dye absorbs that light, it then shoots it out at a lower wavelength. 
So it basically comes in at one wavelength, it shoots out at a lower wavelength. Color of light is determined by wavelengths, and so one thing that we'll observe here in a minute is how the light comes in at one color, then the light's going to actually go out at a different color when you observe the, um, observe the cell through the oculars up here. Okay? So it comes in at one wavelength, loses energy, shoots out a different wavelength. So it comes in at one color, loses energy, goes out at a different color. Now fluorescence is the same as, you know, your nice little glow sticks at the football game that you get a whirl around and things. Those glow sticks don't have a lot of energy. My fluorescence doesn't have a lot of energy either. So what we're going to look at is a slide. It's going to be a slide of bovine epithelial cells um, in the pulmonary artery. These cells have been then stained with three different fluorescent dyes. Okay, One fluorescent dye that's going to visualize the um, nucleus. Another fluorescent dye, a mitotracker, that's going to um, help us visualize the mitochondria. A third fluorescent dye, which then is basically um, a GFP or green fluorescent protein dye that's been attached to um, the actin, so we're going to see the cytoskeleton. All right. Now the way that fluorescence works is that we have our mercury vapor lamp here. Light shines up through this tube to the front here. I have a dial right here. This dial has various filters. So I have four filters on this dial. One is for bright field, one is a Psi 3 filter, one is a GFP filter, and one is a DAPI filter. So the filter then filters out the unwanted light because this is a full spectrum light. So the unwanted light gets filtered out, it goes through, hits a mirror, goes down and comes right down on top of my slide that has been dyed. So when I throw in a certain filter then, it only allows one kind of light in, and that light then is going to come down on top of my slide. And when it comes down on top of my slide, then my um, fluorescent dye is going to absorb it. And then it's going to shoot back out at a, um, at a different um, wavelength, a smaller wavelength. So what we're going to see here is light coming in. We'll see light emitting here. And we'll see a little bit of light shining back out. Then it shoots back out to our eyes. And what we see then is going to be um, is that fluorescence light coming off. Okay. Now what we want to specifically examine in the cells are mitochondria. And mitochondria are extremely important to cells and important to visualize. Mitochondria are not only the way that ATP is generated in the cells, but they also have critical roles in neurodegenerative diseases such as Alzheimer's and Parkinson's disease. Thus the ability to quantify uh, mitochondria in cells and quantify the activity of mitochondria can have important ramifications. Such ramifications could um, be related to cancer research or research on neurodegenerative diseases. Now in this particular um, slide then we're going to use a dye called MitoTracker Red. We're also going to combine that with analysis of the cytoskeleton to look at the um, actin in the fluorescent dyes. So by combining the two dyes, then we'll be able to um, specifically follow the mitochondria. So what I have here then is our microscope that's set up. I'm going to open up the stop here. I have my um, light right here. You can see in the background this turn orange-red. So when we're talking about fluorescence, we have green light down here. This is our mitotracker um, red dye. It starts off with green light because it is um, stimulated by green light. Green light's about 500 nanometers, loses energy, okay, increases that wavelength to a longer wavelength, about 700 nanometers, so fluoresces off as this orange-red when it started as green dye. Now I'm going to make sure that I get this in focus. This is really hard to focus, so I'm going to go very delicately to focus this. And once I have it in focus, then I'm going to snap a picture of this. Okay. And it's, uh, and then I'll show you this photo in a few minutes. All right. And I'm going to swing this dial over to the next one. And the background is really hard to see. This is a green fluorescent dye in the background. Right here, you can see that it starts off with blue. So this is my um, GFP filter. Starts off with blue as blue light, 
Then it fluoresces and in, in the background you can see slightly green light. Okay, fluoresces off as green. I'm going to take another picture of this one. All right, blue light is 400 to 500 nanometers. Here's now I'm going to go to our third filter. This one's kind of fun because down here we can't see any light at all. The reason for that is because it begins as UV light. Then in the background, um, we can usually see, oops, that's not the right one. There we go. A little bit better. So this starts out as UV light where we can't see it at all. In the background, we can see slight blue components being the nuclei. So I'm going to snap that picture. And then um, blue light in the background then, 400 to 500 nanometers. UV light, um, <clears throat> shorter than 400 nanometers. When it loses energy, then it becomes visual. Now I'll show you the images we just made. This image is of a DAPI stain. A DAPI stain is a fluorescent stain that has an affinity for DNA. The DAPI stain is stimulated by UV light and then fluoresces in the visible spectrum as blue light. The blue ovals you see in this image are therefore the nuclei of the cells. There are approximately 11 cells visualized in this image. Here's the second image, and it's of the cytoskeleton. The cytoskeleton is comprised of microtubules and microfilaments, and they innervate the entire cell. The cytoskeleton gives the cell its shape. It helps organize various components of the cell. It facilitates um, movement, and it helps in cell division. The specific fibers you see in this image are the actin fibers of the microfilaments. And it's interesting how researchers developed this stain. Phloidin is a lethal toxin obtained from the death cap mushroom, Amanita phloides. And phloidin kills people by binding to the actin fibers of the cells. So researchers figured out how to conjugate the green fluorescent protein to phloidin and use the phloidin to bind to the actin in the cells. Now, green fluorescent protein is also called GFP for short and should sound familiar. So GFP comes from jellyfish deep in the ocean. They use it to be able to help light up the darkness. The cool part is the biologists have taken the DNA from the jellyfish and are able to stick it into other organisms and have the organisms produce the GFP and glow. For example, they've made glowing plants you can buy online, glowing fish, glowing rabbits, glowing cats, glowing sheep. They've even gone so far as to make glowing chimpanzees that have the capability of making glowing babies. So the ability to visualize the cytoskeleton is a result of the combination of a variety of biological principles, techniques, and information. Okay, last but not least is the slide of the mitochondria. So if you look at this slide here, you can see all those little teeny tiny dots in the cells. So these are the same cells as in the other two images, in the same locations, and all these teeny tiny dots are mitochondria. So mitochondria are the powerhouses of the cells. They're basically the sizes of bacteria. So when you looked at the bacteria earlier, then these are the same sizes of the bacteria um, that we saw on those cheek cells. So finally then, um, since we didn't move any of the images underneath the microscopes, these images are all um, exactly the same. So I can go into a program and merge all three images into a single composite image where we can look at all three things, the nucleus, the cytoskeleton, and the mitochondria at the same time. And this has um, many, many, many applications to all sorts of research associated with cells.